Thank you. Good luck to everyone. Uh, so hi everyone and welcome to today's Journal Club. I'd like to thank IGCS and ESGO for their support in our Journal Club. Before we begin, I want to mention a few housekeeping notes relevant to the Zoom platform for today's Journal Club. We're recording today's discussion and the recording will be made publicly available. Participants with cameras turned on may appear in the video recording. We ask that everyone please keep your microphones muted so everyone can hear the presentations. If you are having any difficulties or questions, please send a message in chat and our technical support will assist. We'll have time for Q&A and encourage you to submit questions via the chat function throughout today's session. And with that, I'm happy to hand it over to Dr. Reni Pereja. Thank you, Arthur, for introduction. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, it is my pleasure to be here. Welcome, all of you. This month's lead article is Uterine Transposition for Fertility and Ovarian Function Preservation after Radiotherapy by Dr. Reita Rivero from Hospital Erasto Garner in Curitiba, Brazil. I'm pleased uh, to welcome him to join us. Reitan, thank you for being with us today and sharing a deeper insight into this great article. I'm going to hand it over to you for a summation of the article. So thank you so much, Rene, and thank you for ESGO and IGS for this opportunity. It's uh, it's an honor to, to join you today and uh, speak a little bit more about uterine transposition. So we can start sharing the presentation. So this study started in 2017, and the idea was to evaluate if, if uterine transposition was a feasible procedure uh, to preserve uterine and ovarian function. So we wanted to make sure we could start from somewhere and, uh, uh, and make sure we, we were going to do something safe and, uh, and feasible. So next slide, please. So what we know now, wh where do we start? We know that pelvic cancer frequently need pelvic radiation as part of the treatment. And we know that uh, radiation causes ovarian failure, even in low doses. But it's very important to understand that it's not just ovarian failure. You have all the uterine myo myofibrosis, you have the endometrium damage, vascular damage. And so those uterus are not uh, capable of carrying uh, spontaneous pregnancy uh, and healthy uh, pregnancies. So it's very important to preserve also the uterine function, meaning the, the capability of getting pregnant and, um, and delivering uh, a baby. So the objective of the trial was to evaluate this uh, capability of preserving the uterus more than uh, preserving fertility and the point is, why not fertility? Because you need more patients, you need more time. So we, we wanted to start with something that could be measured. And it was like uh, menses, uh, hormonal function, and all that. So that's why that this is a small trial. Um, and uh, more to evaluate function than specifically uh, pregnancies. But uh, we also evaluate pregnancies uh, complications, surgical complications, and other factors involved with the procedure. So we started this prospective trial, uh, multi-centric trial in, 2000, in June 2017, and we were allowed to select patients until June 2019. Next, please. So what are the main results? After... Uh, having eight patients accepted to, to participate in the trial. One patient lost the uterus because of uterine necrosis. This uh, patient did not lose both ovaries. She, she lost one of the ovaries and the other one we managed to, to keep. So she has normal function until now, uh, hormonal function, but she has no uh, condition of having uh, pregnancy. Another patient died uh, four months after transposing the uterus to the upper abdomen because of carcinomatosis. So before being able to try to put her uterus back to the pelvis, she died from cancer. So a very uh, serious uh, cancer, a very uh, really bad evolution. 
The other six patients managed to keep the ovaries and the uterus. Uh, they have normal menses, they have a normal hormonal function. And uh, three of those patients tried to get pregnant. One of them tried even with three IVFs uh, in, in vitro fertilization and see, she didn't manage to. But the other two patients who tried to get pregnant got spontaneously pregnant. They had like normal uh, pregnancies and healthy babies after 37 and 38 uh, weeks. Uh, next, please. So this is just to, to give you a full picture of uh, the trial. Uh, how do we evaluate those, uh, those hormonal function and uterine function? So we decide to use uh, menses as a way of uh, measuring uh, uterine function. And all the patients have uh, regular menses. And this is very important because if in less than one year, one of those patients stop having regular menses or do not did not have hormonal function, the, they would be considered uh, not a successful case. So they would be considered that we didn't, didn't manage to preserve their function. So hormonal function and menses were very important to us. Uh, another thing is that we, we realize that some patients, they have a complication. Um, the most com common complication was cervical ischemia. Um, so you have to be careful because usually that's not a major complication. You can manage that. And we realize that by uh, ischemic signs at the cervix, like this blue color, or not a very good per perfusion. And usually they develop this uh, stenosis, but you can easily treat it with um, dilatation uh, and very simple maneuvers. So all those patients after simple maneuvers at the time of reimplantation, they manage to, to have normal masses and normal hormonal function. So this is something that we also saw it in the uh, early cases. So in the first probably four cases, we had the ischemia, um, the ischemic uh, cervix, and afterwards we didn't have it anymore. So uh, it's related to some technical aspects. We can comment on that later. Uh, but I think in the end, the most important thing is we have in the literature uh, five cases, reported cases of women who got uh, pelvic radiation and got pregnant. And uh, well, now we have seven, uh, actually eight cases. So, and three of them are with this recent uh, technique, which is uterine transposition. So in less than three years, we have more reports of pregnancies and deliveries than for the last 50 years uh, of uh, traditional treatment. So this is, I think it's uh, the main outcome of, of the procedure. Next. So this is a, a compilation of the data. So eight cases, actually we, we recruited 11 patients. Three of them did not accept to join the trial. So we include eight patients. One uterine necrosis, one patient died from cancer. Six patients we managed to, to have full preservation uh, and uh, two of them have babies. So in conclusion, we, uh, we think that uterine transposition, it's a feasible procedure uh, to preserve gonadal and uterine fu function in patients requiring uh, pelvic radiation for non-gynecological cancers, uh, preserving their capability of getting spontaneously pregnant and have uh, su successful deliveries. Next. Hey, do you have another slide? I think that's the last one. Okay, Reitan, thank you very much on a nice and impressive uh, uh, description of of the of your article. Thank uh, you. We will now spend the remaining time on answering questions and group discussions. Attendees, we encourage you to submit questions via the chat function, and we'll do our best to address as many as possible. We're going to start out with some questions by our fellows, but the first question will be done by Arthur. Arthur, can you proceed, please? Yes, thank you so much, Rainy. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Rivero, for your uh, excellent 
the presentation. And I just have one question. So one patient with rectal cancer died of um, carcinomatosis four months after a uterine transposition. Do you think that surgery for a uterine transposition prior to radiotherapy as primary treatment for a non gyn cancer could potentially cause a peritoneal spread of tumor in the abdomen? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, probably this is one of the central questions about the procedure is how uh, the procedure can affect survival of those patients. and. Um, and we are quite comfortable to, to, to say that probably it's not related to procedure itself because we are doing ovarian transpositions for those patients for more than 30 years now. And there are many papers uh, saying that ovarian transposition is safe. So it's fair to think that uterine transposition doesn't add too much to the procedure at the point that we would say that uh, it, it was the cause of uh, the the bad evolution of this particular case. I think this is more something of uh, uh, related to the nature of the disease itself. However, we have to to keep in mind that this may happen, and we need to to keep survive the surveillance uh, to see after when we have more cases, more, larger number of patients, we may have uh, be more confident to to say that it's not related. Until now, it's probably not related to 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 the surgery itself. Mm -hmm. Right, and but anyway, those patients are patients with locally advanced rectal cancer yeah. that have a natural history and a proper behavior. So mm -hmm. we need to be careful when selecting the patient. But we are going to miss some patients due to disease, most likely. Yeah. It's very likely, and actually that's something that we discuss with the patients prior to the procedure, that they may have a recurrence. And uh, so that's why we usually ask them to wait for two years before trying to get pregnant. It it, it doesn't work, <laughs> actually, because when patients decide to, to, you know, to get pregnant, you know, like uh, we say in Brazil, you cannot stop a patient who really wants to get pregnant. Perfect. Thank you very much, Rayton, for your answer. Luigi, do you have a question for Rayton? Yes. Uh, first of all, thank you, Dr. Ribeiro, for your fantastic study. And based on this study, I suppose that many oncological centers worldwide might be interested in implementing this procedure or to start some pilot studies on this topic. So what would you, would you suggest to these centers? And also, since you are collecting data on this topic, would you allow new centers to join your study? Thank you. So, uh, yeah, that would be great because we have a study. The, the study in Brazil, we got an extension so we can keep doing it until 2030. So we have more eight, uh, seven years more to work on the cases. Uh, obviously, it will depend on each country that they have their own regulations. And what we are working now is to, if you are in a center from Brazil, it's very easy to join the trial. We just request and they just add a new center. So it's very easy if you are inside Brazil. And the other countries will depend. Some countries use other countries' regulation. And if the other country has an approval, they it can easily start doing it. But most of the countries will ask for a specific trial in the country. Uh, or a specific approval. So what we are doing now is we are working in an international protocol that could be easily adopted by other countries. I think that's the easiest way now. And I believe that we are at the point that you do need to join our trial specifically, but you can start your own uh, prospective evaluation in uh, your center. So I think that's way easier. And then we can put all together in the same platform and collect data prospectively. Uh, but considering each center may have their own uh, prospective data, probably that, that's the easiest way because we will need lots of centers because this is such a uncommon surgery that if you wanna get large numbers, we, we have to make it very easy to all centers who are interested to, 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 to do it. Um, and we also have this discussion within our group is when uterine transposition stop being something experimental and start being something that you can offer to all patients. 
Uh, and we have some disagreement. And actually, I'm probably one of the more conservative guys in the group. And uh, and uh, some people believe that, okay, that's enough. We now have enough data because you don't have other options. You don't have other good options for those patients. I know rich countries, you may have access to IVF, but most of the countries, they don't. So especially for those countries, they may go... Direct and start doing the procedure. Perfect. Thank you very much, Raytan. We have a, a question from one of the attendants. Uh, there is congratulating you. Thanks for your great work. In the letter, I reported other techniques to preserve uterine function, such as round ligament suspension or uterine ventral fixation. Do you think that the transposition is always the best displacement technique, or it can be tailored according to the radiation dose that is supposed? To be received by the uterus? Yeah, that's, uh, I think, one of the greatest things about uh, uterine transposition is that it brought light back uh, to something that people were not looking anymore. And I'm quite sure that uh, there will be other options for those patients and not just uterine transposition. Uh, and I think that ventral fixation, which is like uh, taking the uterus to uh, to the uh, to the abdominal wall or suturing the, suturing the uterus to the abdominal wall may may be a really good option for maybe lots of cases maybe more than uterine transposition. Uh, we need more studies about that, so we're still working on uh, something that uh, we don't have data, but it probably it would work, especially now uh, with more advanced radiation techniques. So we you may not need. A uterine transposition, for instance, for a canal anal carcinoma, maybe you manage to 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 do it uh, without a uterine transposition, just ventral fixation. But there are lots of questions that need to be answered uh, before saying that's a feasible and safe procedure. Another thing about uh, a ventral fixation is uh, most of the cases, and you you may correct me if I'm saying something wrong, but you have to to do a an ovarian transposition. So you have to detach the ovaries from the uterus. So in the end, you will need uh, IVF for those patients. So you need in vitro fertilization for those patients. So it's going to exclude like half of the world, of this, this maybe 70% of the world of, of having access to, to IVF. Because usually those patients, they don't get pregnant spontaneously. You need some IVF, some sorts of IVF. So, and, uh, and I think that's one of the points we have to discuss. So probably, and I hope we will have three or four different procedures that we will allow those patients and you can pick one of them uh, as an option. Sorry, thank you very much, Reitan. We have a question from Guido Balsaki from Argentina. Thank you, Dr. Ribeiro. Um, yes, my question is, um, which step of the technique uh, do you think is the most challenging one? And if you think that there is still place to improve the technique? I think, well, the, the pelvic part of the procedure is quite easy. I mean, we we all are very used to, to anyone who is doing a simple hist handle the pelvic part of the procedure is quite easy. Um, the retroperitoneal part of this disease, the surgery, it's uh, the more difficult part. I wouldn't say difficult. I would say more uh, time consuming and uh, you have to be very careful and take your time and be on the right plane because you don't want to cause any trauma to those vessels. So more than difficult, it's more like a, a hard working part of the surgery. Um, but that's the most difficult part of the surgery for sure. But still, it's something that gynecologists will do it easily because they are used to retroperitoneal dissection. So it's uh, it's uh, not so difficult. Uh, and yes, there's uh, still lots of room for improvement, and we mm -hmm. have been doing that too. And I have seen surgery from from other colleagues, and um, they also helped a lot to to change and evolve the procedure. So one of the things that we now are doing, we are not attaching the cervix at the umbilicus anymore. 
uh, I know it's kind of awkward having umbilical menses in most of patients think, well, actually the patients, they don't care and they are more interested in preserving their fertility. And uh, if you explain them that that's not a problem, that's going to happen, that's, that's good if you have normal umbilical menses. But I know most of the doctors, they, they don't, don't like it. And, it. and actually, it's also time consuming to attach the cervix to the umbilical. So now we give some Lupron or whatever you want to keep them without menses, and we live inside the abdomen. What happens is they have like a hematocope, uh, more uh, mucosil and other complications, but they are minor and you just drain and you have no, no major complications when you leave the cervix inside the abdomen. And we, and we used to do that because we want to make sure the flap, because the uterus is a flap, had good perfusion. So the best way to do it is look at it. So just look at it and you can check twice a day if it, there is good perfusion. So now as we are more confident about the procedure, we are, we are leaving it inside the abdomen. And, uh, and obviously as this is a, a new procedure, we are seeing small improvements done by different groups. And I'm very happy to say that I'm learning a lot of other colleagues. Thank you, Raiden. I, I have a question about the technical issue. Are mm. you still putting sutures and stitches uh, outside the abdominal cavity or are you just doing using internal suture right now? Yeah, I still do it. I, I mean, that's the worst part of for the patients. They have the, their typical complaint is pain on those stitches. They 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 cause lots of pain to, to the patients. Uh, and I'm not suturing. I mean, you can do laparoscopic suture. It's it's time consuming, takes longer. Sometimes it's harder. And one of the things is I don't want to make traction to the ovarian vessels because I do this suture around the abdominal wall. So most of the time you don't have enough length to do it with the abdomen uh, insufflated. With so you have to deflate a little bit and then suture so it makes it harder. But I think that uh, Mario Leitan from Memorial and other colleagues, especially who are doing it using robotics, are doing it uh, with the peritone with the pneumoperitoneum. I still do it transparietally. Um, and that's the, the, the next step I have to move forward probably and uh, just do it intrabdominally. Perfect. Thank you very much, Raytan. We have a question from Jorge Hegel from Venezuela. Yes. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Rivero, for this amazing article. So my question is, one of the most relevant complications was cervical ischemia in 37%. Based on your experience, do you think there is a way to reduce the percentage of this complication? And what could be the main cause? Yeah. So what happened is, looking at the video of those patients, we realized that uh, it happened to the patients that when we entered the cervix during the paracervical dissection. So now what we are doing, we are preserving the descending branch of the uterine artery. And now we don't, we didn't have any cases of ischemia anymore, of cervical ischemia. And so the cervix looks way, way more uh, perfused blood, with, with blood. Uh, and we didn't have any more cases of stenosis or whatever. So probably what happened was we entered the cervix so we could see some, uh, we getting too deep into the cervix and then we are losing those, this va lateral vascularization of the cervix. So now what we recommend is do a little bit more lateral, like a type A radical hysterectomy, something in between the ureter and the cervix, so you keep this lateral uh, blood supply of the cervix. That's a very important point. I think that's something that it's very important to stress about the technique. Nice, nice, right? I mean, such a such a good tip. I have a, a couple of questions from the from the audience. One is, uh, where the uterus is transposed, it is away from pelvis. How the vascularization is secure after transposition and after reimplantation? Can you repeat the question? I didn't get the, the... When the uterus is transposed, 
is away from the pelvis. How oh, yeah. can can you assure the vascularization during the uterus is put in the in the abdominal wall and before putting again into the pelvic cavity? So what we know is uh, from uh, from radical trachelectomy that you can ligate both uterine arteries, right? So that's uh, that's been done for more than thirty years now. So we know we can ligate both the uterine arteries. And uh, the cases of uterine necrosis after radical trachelectomy are very rare. Obviously, people tend not to describe bad results, but we know it's probably around 1% or less. So we know that the ogonadal vessels are enough to, to provide blood supply to the uterus. That's we know. So the point is, if I keep the vessels coming from the, the retroperitoneal area, the ovarian vessels, we can keep enough blood supply to preserve the, the uterus. So now what we do is, after dissecting those vessels, not exactly the vessels itself, we dissect the whole package with the vessels and the fatty tissue. You don't want to dissect those vessels too close, so you just remove this fatty tissue around uh, along the the, the infundibular pelvic and the gonadal vessels. So when we, we put it in the upper abdomen, usually you can clearly see there is good perfusion. Sometimes you can even see the gonadal vessels pumping blood. But what we do now is we use ICG. So we use IT, IC, intravenous ICG, and in less than one minute you have uh, the uterus being perfused, so we are sure we are getting blood enough blood supply. The other yes, thing sir, we right. do, yeah. yeah, yeah, please, please. The other thing we do is in the post op, we do a Doppler ultrasound. So two days after surgery, I'm sorry, Nev, if, if I'm being you know like redundant, but I think that some some people uh, are getting into it for the first time. That's that's why. No, it's great. It's great, right? And having okay. explanation by you, it's okay. amazing. Okay, good. So then what we do is two days after surgery, we do a Doppler ultrasound. So transabdominal Doppler ultrasound of the gonadal vessels. And at the level of the ovarian uterine ligament, we check for blood flow. And usually it's very easy to find it, but obviously you need some uh, uh, the, radi uh, the radiologists uh, takes a little bit of time to, to get used to it. But once they got the idea, because for them, for them it's just weird, they, they, they don't understand. So once they understand, usually they easily find, because they just find the uterus and they just go lateral. And then you have the gonadal vessels, it's not difficult. But one of the things that we are real, we realize that sometimes the blood flow, you don't know if it is just enough, because sometimes they will check for blood flow and there will be very little blood flow coming from the, those vessels. Is this enough? And actually what we realize that usually yes, so you don't have to do anything with those patients. And even we had a case of a patient who had just unilateral blood flow coming from an ovarian vessel. And they say, well, she may lose the ut her uterus. And, and actually she didn't. So she had a really good evolution. And when we re-implanted the uterus, it was perfect. So if you have enough blood supply coming from one side, you probably doesn't need to do anything. And then another thing that we used to do in the beginning, now we don't do anymore. We, if we, we used to do MRIs, so to check, because with the MRI, you can see perfusion. So it's very easy to see perfusion during an MRI. And something that if you are not sure about the uterine perfusion, just do an MRI. You cannot um, rely on clinical examination because the cervix may be ischemic. So you, you don't know if the uterus. So if you have some ischemia of the cervix, you may have a good uterus. So I recommend you to use MRI. On the other hand, when you put it back, usually after two or three months, the uterus ha has those big gonadal vessels. So you are not afraid of uh, losing vascularization. The only thing is you have to make sure you don't rotate the uterus because you can, if you twist the uterus, you may cause a block of uh, the blood flow. And, uh, 
And uh, it's very incredible how fast those patients heal and how fast they resume normal menses. And if they have normal menses, they have a good uterine perfusion. Thank you very much, Freitan. We have a question from Seda. Thank you, Dr. Ribery, for your exam presentation. My question is how long and at what, what dose uh, did you use anticoagulant after uterine transposition and during the pregnancies? Sorry, can, can you repeat it? How long and at what dose did you use anticoagulants after the oh, uterine good. transposition and during the pregnancies? That's a really good question. So when you, while well, you are using a flap, right? And this is a cancer patient. So just for those two reasons, you have to use at least for 28, 20, so one month of, uh, of anticoagulation. And do you, we do it exactly like we do a regular prophylaxis for any major procedure in gagnon. So we use it for one month, then we stop it. Um, what This was a big issue when we started because we had this discussion with the vascular team uh, to know if we should use like uh, another agent or for a longer period of time. And they said, well, we do, we do this for many different procedures in one month, usually more than enough. So that's why we do just one month. When the patients get pregnant, we don't use any kind of uh, anticoagulant. They... they they just uh, go through a normal, uh, not a normal schedule. They are considered a high risk for complications, so it's a high risk uh, pregnancy. But we don't use a, a, any kind of antithrombotic prophylaxis. Perfect, great, and thank you very much. We have a question from Vansa. Uh, thank you for an interesting study. How can this procedure be implemented in hospitals where surgeon has never done it before? Also, should there be a specific criteria for declining patient request for this procedure? That's a good question. So, uh, <laughs> declining the procedure, you know what? That's that's more often than we think. <laughs> I'm, I'm, sometimes I decline some patients when you are, you are not confident of they being able to understand the procedure. This is one of the things. So they need to understand it because uh, they are high high risk for for pregnancies. So they have to have this different schedule even be much more. They need to be reliable because the thing that you don't want to have a high risk pregnancy in a patient who are you know like doesn't do any of the things that they they have to do. Um, but the main reason for declining uh, putting patients on the trial were anatomical changes like surgery of the ovaries or previous pelvic radiation or if they need to change any part of their tr cancer treatment. That's, that's one of the things that to start the procedure when we got the approval, one of the one of the first things they said to us is the patients have to do the cancer treatment. So to include the patient in the, in the trial, we said, you understand that you must do all the treatment and you must follow with all the, the, uh, the treatment, uh, standard treatment, and they, they had to accept it because you don't want to a patient who doesn't do the treatment, the proper treatment for the cancer. You don't want to have a mother with cancer. You want to have the, the best possible results, especially when you are starting something new you cannot allow for any deviation of the standard procedures regarding cancer treatment. Thank you very much, Raytan. We have a question from Giuseppe Cusinella. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Ribeiro. Uh, my first question is about uh, the point of the pregnancies. So considering that normal uterine vascularization is impaired after the transposition, we can suppose that this patient could be at either re higher risk of pregnancy complications such as intrauterine growth restriction. So how can we evaluate that risk without assessing the uterine vessel pulsatility index? And the second question is if you administer cardioaspirin uh, to these drugs during the pregnancies. Yeah, probably that's uh, 
that's the most scary part of the procedure. So I wanted to change what I said before. What was the most part, difficult part of the procedure? It's when patients get pregnant because we, you, you get scared because this is something new and you don't want to have any complication during the pregnancy because uh, imagine that we, if we have something like a really bad or a malformation, we know it's not related to the procedure, but how bad it would be or if the patient had a restriction growth and uh, a very small baby or very early uh, delivery or something like that. So, but what what uh, helped us was the, the studies from uh, the Germans groups from uh, the Charité, because those patients are very similar to for from uh, to patients from radical tracheotomy. So patients from radical tracheotomy, we have more than thousand of those not we, I mean, the literature. And we know that those patients, they can have normal uh, normal pregnancies or at least close to normal. What we know is from radical tracheotomy is more common to have a, a early delivery or a, you know preterm delivery. But if you take caution of, if you, if you watch it closely, and that's why we use the German protocol. I don't know how, how they call it. It's from the, the Charité group uh, for radical trachelectomy. They are considered high risk. So they have very often schedule of appointments. We do like all the ultrasounds every month to make sure the cervix has uh, the right length, the baby's having uh, satisfactory growth. And, uh, and uh, usually we recommend to delivery by C-section at 38 weeks. So we don't want to put the baby on stress during a vaginal delivery or something like that. Uh, but we know we can follow those patients without the uterine arteries or checking uh, blood flow in the uterine arteries. So you can follow those patients strictly like every month. And then in the last third of, um, after 28 weeks, we do it every week. Uh, you can follow those patients in, uh, and it's safe. Uh, and they, in this study from the Charité group, they realized that if you follow those patients strictly, they have the same, uh, except for, for premature uh, delivery, they have the same rate of complication of a normal patient. But you have to follow them strictly. So it's not that you can just, well, come back here when you are 40, 40 weeks. No, you have to be uh, this have this schedule and do the delivery at 30 they recommend 37 weeks. We are waiting until 38, 38 weeks because they have a normal cervix. So the chance of premature delivery is not that that uh, high. Perfect, great. Right I'll try to summarize some similar questions in the chat and my own question. Uh, okay. There are publications on women undergoing radical trachelectomy uh, having intermediate risk factors when transposition has been done, or even patients with cervical cancer with nodal involvement or micrometastasis needing radiotherapy. What are your thoughts on these kind of indications different to rectal cancer or sarcomas or another, another pelvic tumors non, of non-hynecological origin? Yeah, that's... Uh... Uh, Professor Professor Kelly said that we have opened this Pandora box and now we have to deal with all these new possibilities and uh, in uh, different situations. I think for non cervical right, vulva uh, and vaginal cancer, that's okay. If you if you if the surgical radiation field is the same, probably doesn't make any difference if you just mobilize the uterus. Uh, for vaginal cancer, what we do, we have done that, is we keep the cervix attached to the vagina and we mobilize the uterus like in a transposition. So we keep irradiating the cervix and also the, the lymph nodes around the uterine vessels to the pelvis. So they keep the, this structure and they irradiate the cervix, the vagina, and the, all the lymph nodes. Um, for vulvar cancer, I think it's easier. It's closer to a rectal uh, canal now cancer, I would say something like that. For cervical cancer, well, now we have a problem because 
probably this would be the largest indication for uterine transposition. Probably this would be the most common indication uh, in highly selected cases. What I mean by highly selected cases, I mean patients with very small cervical tumors, a very big margin because uh, uh, do we need three or four centimeters in the cervix in a patient with less than, I don't know, three or four millimeters of invasion? Probably not. And in this case, it's probably the more important part of the radiation. It's uh, the paracervix and the, the lymph nodes. So, or patients like with a micrometastasis in the lymph node uh, and a very small cervical tumor. So we have cases like that reported. And probably irradiating the paracervix and the lymph nodes are the most important part. However, we are not sure that's safe. So we, we need to be very careful uh, when selecting those patients. And indeed, you may consider that, imagine this situation, you have a small cervical tumor, you have a micrometastasis in the, para, in the in lymph node. Maybe you could just do a lymphadenectomy for this patient and you achieve something like cure those patients. Maybe, maybe. I don't know. So we have to explore other other options. Uh, what I do not recommend is doing new adjuvant treatment to shrink a tumor and do a rad and do a transposition. Uh, we have many papers with new adjuvant treatment for cervical cancer and most of the time they don't end well. So I do not recommend to do I, I think we need way more data before starting doing uh, conservative treatment for big uh, cervical tumors. So I think that's a little bit too much. Thank you very much, Raytan. There is another question from the audience. Do you think that the approach, laparotomy or laparoscopy, may affect the success rate of the procedure? There's... Uh, um, I think it's easy. It's easier to do it open, uh, uh, laparoscopically. Yeah. Uh, I think it's easier. The point is you need training, right? So it's a, it's a very, very important question because usually we think with the experience we have, but again, probably most of the world do not have access to laparoscopy. I know it may shock you because if you are a Gagnon fellow, or if you are a gynecologist, you probably in, are in a country or in a place that have access. But half of the world doesn't have access to, to even simple laparoscopy. So in these cases, yes, I would consider doing it open. And actually when we propose, when we talk to the patients about the procedure, we say that we may need conversion to achieve the surgery. And uh, that's another good question because you may say, if I need to convert to open surgery, should I do it anyway? And I would say, yes, why not? If you if you need to like convert a cholestectomy to open to achieve what your goals and for the patient's safety, you should do it. So I think it's okay to do open. I think it's harder, but I think it's okay. You may have more complications related to recovery and to the abdominal wall. Um, but if you have the proper knowledge, I, I don't see any problem in doing it open. So yes, I think it's possible. Not my preferred option, but it's possible. Thank you very much. We have a question from Matt Bagar. Matt, you're mute. Sorry. Thank you so much. <laughs> nice. Um, so in other literature, ovarian transposition is effective in about 50% of cases at preserving ovarian function when pelvic radiation is located. <laughs> and I'm curious how the addition of uterine transposition affects that anticipated hormonal outcome and how patients are counseled on this uh, when they're considering this procedure. Yeah, that's a good, uh, that's a very good observation because if you're taking account that just 50%, <laughs> why do we expect to have 90% doing uterine disposition that may, doesn't make sense. But I would say if you read careful the papers about uh, about uh, ovarian transposition, sometimes it's not clear how how high, how how close to the subcostal margin the, the ovaries were placed. So this is one of the point. And there is a paper, it's, uh, I don't remember the author, I'm sorry, 
but there is a paper saying that when you put the ovaries 1.5 centimeters uh, higher than the anterior sciatic spine, you can preserve up to 90% of the, the gonadal function. So probably, and I have seen that a lot, and probably you also seen that a lot, some ovarian transposition, there are more like, you know, just small lateral fixations of the ovaries. So as we have lots of cervical cancer, we have lots of experience doing that. And usually we put it at the level of the tip of the liver. So very, very, uh, let's say, that's uh, uh, close to the liver and at the subcostal margin. We we usually do not accept like small mobilizations of the ovaries when you, we are doing that. And also you have to consider that for cervical cancer, usually we use higher doses of radiation than we use for rectal cancer. So we may it, this may also have some effect on this. On this. Um, another point is maybe we are doing it in younger patients, I don't know. Maybe we have better patients, um, highly selected patients, because you we are not doing, you know, it's a highly selected patient. And also for ovarian transposition in cervical cancer, some patients irradiate the retroperitoneum or the infra mesenteric area, and then you may, may lose the ovaries even after a transposition. Uh, so I think that's those are the main reasons for having had a better result in terms of uh, ovarian function. Perfect, great, and thank you very much. Uh, this is an, an interesting concept in this question. Thank you for a wonderful study. Could you tell me the optimal timing for transplantation? What are the post-surgery treatment? Is there transplant rejections? My question is, is there a transplantation? Or is there a transposition? And can you explain the audience the difference between transposition and transplantation? Yeah, that's a very, very central question. I think one of the things from transplant is you got an organ from another person and you reimplant in a different in a different one. So when we are talking about transposition, it is all in the same patient. So I just mobilize the uterus to the upper abdomen in this same patient, two or three months after that, I put the uterus back to the pelvis. So we reimplant the uterus in the same patient. So it's the same patient. Uh, this patient always have the same, uh, the vascularization is preserved by, by the ovarian vessels. And so it's in the same patient. When you we, we talk about transplant, we take a uterus for one patient and put in the other patient. Uh, and actually, for for irradiated cancer patients, probably transplant is not a good option because the, the changes radiation causes to the pelvis of those patients. So it's uh, I, it's a little bit harder to suture in a vessel who have been irradiated, like the internal iliac, which is the usually the arter artery you're gonna use for a transplant. Um, and even the veins are. You have a, it's more difficult to work with the veins in irradiated patients. So that's why I think that transplant for those patients usually are not, is, is not a, the best option. Also, you have to consider when you use transplant, you need to use your, your immune suppression to this patient. So, so this patient have a, has a cancer. And you know that we know that uh, the immune system has an important role. Treat for treating those patients and maybe for keeping the cancer away. And then you start using suppression. So probably that's not the safest way to, to deal with a cancer patient. But you can do it later, years later, the, the treatment. That that's, uh, sounds uh, uh, way better. But you, I mean, that probably using uh, immune suppression in the cancer patient is not the best option right after or during the cancer treatment. Perfect. I, I think it's similar to when you need to put a, a kidney down in the pelvis due to an accident or due to a trauma. It's just a change of the original location. Uterine transposition is a temporary change of original location uh, after, um, 
Meanwhile, giving receiving the radiotherapy, but then you will put the the organ in the in the same place. But this is not a transplantation yeah, uh, by, by definition. It's not a transplantation. Um, I have another question: Is how long will be the hormonal function be back? Is this a fast phenomenon? You have to wait some months or whatever. It's right away. So, uh, uh, and when I mean right away, I mean right away because when we put those uterus in the, in the, we attach the cervix to the umbilicus, they have menses. And usually they have regular menses right, right after surgery. And I was actually, I was expecting them to, to have like, uh, to stay month without menses and stuff like that because we see that sometime after you know, like regular surgery, it's very common to the patients to, to delay the menses and stuff like that. And actually it didn't happen. They, they kept normal function um, even when the uterus was in the umbilicus. But if you use like a uh, Lupron or other treatments to avoid menses, then you have the time uh, uh, from the med medicine working. So usually three or four or six months, depending on the dose you are using and how long you are going to use it. But once you put it back to the pelvis and you don't have any drugs suppressing menses, they start having menses in, you know, it's like a normal cycle in 15 days sometimes, 10 days sometimes, one month, whatever, but they they keep those regular menses. And that's very interesting. I wasn't expecting that at all, to be honest. And I was expecting them to have delays in, dysfunction and uh, and stuff like that again though are those are highly selected patients so it may happen may help perfect Th there is a question from hassan al salman hassan can you ask your question because i i don't understand quite well the the question as written uh yes thank you so much for this wonderful uh, presentation Actually, it's, it's, it seems a stupid question, but I'm like to think out of the box if this is possible. I um, My question is, uh, can we transfer the uterus with intact uterine artery? I mean, if we can skeletonize the uterine artery and keep it, maybe to tie other vessels like obturator and other anterior branches. I don't know if this will give us a, a, a good space or good length to transfer the uterus. I don't know. I'm just asking. Thank you so much. You know what? What you're saying is really interesting because that's the way of go when we have a different, uh, a difficult, and a new challenge. What I mean by that is we are so used to think and to tell patients that there are no options. This is the only way to go. This is the only way to do it, or, or you have no options. And the uterine transposition is, I think it's the most important thing is that we need to rethink surgery. And so many surgeries we are doing in one way, we, we probably can improve it, or even we can have new procedures. That's not easy. That's not going to happen every day. But that what you said, is that's a very important uh, uh, question because it, and it's uh, probably there will be better ways to do it but we have to to try and you know to, if you think about it what you said it's very reasonable i think the if you take the internal iliac artery you know no like the 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 the, the length of the uterine artery probably you will reach more than 10 to 15 centimeters i don't know you may may be able to preserve the uterine artery and do it uh I'm not sure you can do it, but that's a, that's a good question, fair question. And I think we need to, to think of different ways of doing. It. But for instance, I will give you a perspective of what you're saying. Maybe if you just will need to do a lateral radiation for a sarcoma or something, well, you may just like it one of the sides and you may rotate the uterus and put it in the other side of the pelvis. It's going to work as well as transposing the, you know, like the uterus and stuff like that. So yeah, maybe, maybe it will work. Now I think you will not reach the upper abdomen doing that, but I may be wrong. Maybe you prove it. Hey, thank you. <laughs> Additionally, the, the advantage of 
mobilizing the uterus with the whole infundibular pelvic ligament is you include the drain, the vein drainage that is yep. key when putting an organ in another place. Otherwise, you can put or attach the uterus to epigastric arteries. And by microsurgery, you can do it. But the problem is the veins. You have to attach the veins and if you develop pelvic, you can find more than one vein, most of the time two or three. So it would be put the, the, the procedure more, more difficult that is right now because you are mobilizing all the infundibular pelvic ligament. That that is the reason mm, you had so few uterine necrosis because the vascularization is enough, as has been demonstrated since many years ago doing radical trachelectomies. Yeah, that's a good point. I will keep that on mind. <laughs> uh, I have I have room for for another question. Uh, for cases where cervix is not attached to the umbilicals, is there a preference for what hormonal therapy to start? Uh, as um, I think the question means to uh, contraceptive pills or JNRH analogs. What, what, what is your preference rating? What I do is if the patients are taking uh, anticonception or pills, and they they are using it continuously. I just say to them just keep just keep using it, don't stop it. So I don't like to use like uh, analogs and stuff like that because, I mean, this is a fragile patient going to through cancer cancer treatment, and then you put them on menopause. That's what I don't like about it. You know, like they have been suffering a lot, and then you just add something that can be very hard for women. Um, so that's why I prefer using like uh, contraceptives if they are already using it. Otherwise, I would analogs because I know it they work faster and you just you know the chances of spotting and uh, having masses are lower. But uh, I think that's something that we we will need to figure out the best way to do it. Uh, thank you very much, Reitan. This has been a great journal club. We have more than. 70 people uh, at a time. I would like to invite all of you to put on your cameras in order to take a picture for for Twitter and for social networks. That would be great. See all your faces in that picture. Okay. Ro, Ro Pasarel from Argentina. Megan, Halle, Esther, let's proceed. Okay. Lots of friends. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's great. Arthur, ready? Have you already taken it? Perfect. Great, and again, thank you very much for, for this amazing journal club. Uh, this has been very insightful, and we hope you enjoyed your time with us today. I want to again thank Rayton and all the faculty for their time, and would like to thank all of you for attending the journal. The recording to today's session will be available on IJGC, IGCS, and ESGO websites. Please remember to join us at the January Journal Club uh, when will we discuss the high-tech complications along the years. Thank you very much. Uh, Merry Christmas, <laughs> Happy New Year, and see you next year in January. Bye, my friends. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you.